This is Christina Fiore of MedPage Today reporting for In Focus from the ADA meeting in San Diego. I'm here with Dr. Chip Zimlicki of the FDA. He's the chair of the Artificial Pancreas Initiative there. And we're talking about the new guidance that the FDA just issued on the low glucose suspend, which is a critical component of the artificial pancreas system. Dr. Zimlicki, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. If you can just start out by telling us a little bit about what low glucose, low glucose suspend is and why the FDA is focusing on this element right now. Sure. The low glucose suspend is what we would call the early version of an artificial pancreas. There are three types of artificial pancreas. This, it's the low glucose suspend, the control to range, and control to target. We'll get into the other two later, but the low glucose suspend is uh, and a, a medical device, an expert system that actually shuts off insulin when uh, the CGM reading is low. Um, I would assume that most people know that uh, the artificial pancreas is a, a collection of devices that include a continuous glucose monitor, a blood glucose device or point of care uh, meter, and an insulin pump. What are some of the um, key elements that this guidance is, is hoping to address with the low glucose suspend? The key elements is really um, trying to get a device to market and it, it addresses engineering and it addresses clinical study design. And the real, the real issue is to improve transparency at the FDA by developing the, cl the appropriate clinical study design that will allow um, an, an industry representative or um, an investigator to develop the appropriate safety and effectiveness information for the FDA to approve this product. Great. Um, now, I know that the FDA is also working on a second draft guidance. Um, can you talk a little bit about that at all? At Abs point? Absolutely. It's currently under development. Um, uh, I want to say that the, the first guidance was just recently published and we're, it's in an open sort of comment period for 90 days. And I would urge the, um, the community that may be watching this to um, provide feedback to the FDA because all of the information that we obtain through this initial guidance will um, translate into the development of the second guidance. The second guidance will take care of all the other artificial pancreas systems, the control to range and the control to target. And we're very hopeful that we'll publish that by the end of this year. Again, the same uh, context will, will be in place. We're going to develop a guidance that hopefully will get this device to market. That's the idea. So we're going to recommend safety engineering, we're going to recommend clinical study design, and we're going to do that hopefully by the end of this year. So this morning we saw a lot of new research with regard to the artificial pancreas, and many of the researchers there seem to find it very promising. Uh, but in your opinion, um, what are still some of the challenges that remain before the device will be brought to uh, clinical use? There are a lot of challenges when you um, create this expert system. We've already talked about CGMs. In those studies itself, it sh actually showed significant differences between the continuous glucose monitor reading and the blood glucose, the actual blood glucose reading. So there are CGM inaccuracies, there are point of care glucose meter inaccuracies, and then there are insulin pump defects. We, the insulin pump um, is part of the infusion pump initiative that um, there are over 56,000 adverse events. Uh, and of those, 20, over 25,000 were related to insulin pumps. So there are a lot of challenges when you're linking all three of these devices into one complete expert system. And, the, and it's, it's, a, it's a significant challenge to ask um, an expert system to do more than the sum of its parts. With that being said, FDA believes that these challenges can be overcome and that's what the hope of the guidance is. We're, we, we want them to be able to study these, these challenges and, and be able to um, better understand them so we can then relay that information to the prescribing physician so they can determine whether or not this device is most appropriate for their diabetic subjects or, or, or patient with diabetes. Great. Oh, well, this has been very informative. Thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. At the ADA meeting in San Diego, for In Focus, I'm Christina Fiore, MedPage Today.